All right, got the scout running at last. Thought I'd try her out, keep my skills sharp. Last pre flight, looking good. Pretty centered. I'm risking me pull starting this thing so I can have better audio. I thought I'd tell the story of when my house was robbed as a teenager and the uh, fallout from that. So it started like this. Way back in the day, this is like the early 90s or late 80s, it was fairly normal to get your week's worth of money in cash and then you live on cash during the week. Like now I feel like everyone buys everything with credit cards, but back in the day you might get your week's worth of cash up front. So my mother did that and then one week the cash was just missing. Who knows why? It just, the cash is gone. So she assumed that she made a mistake or that maybe she just flaked out and perhaps didn't get the money like she kind of remembered getting. And uh, that was the end of the story. But the next week when the cash was missing again, she knew it was stolen. That, like, it just had to be, right? So, uh, you know, she mentioned it to the family and such and, and we were like, I don't know anything about it. You're weird. Week three comes along and this is happening reliably like every Friday or Saturday after she would get her money the money would go missing so week three rolls along and it happens again so now there's no doubt there's like it, we're positive that this is happening and she takes her purse and she hides it she used to leave it like sort of hanging by its strap on a kitchen chair and now she's hiding the purse and we think that like this is gonna foil the burglar but somehow it didn't she put it in a kitchen cabinet and the burglar knew to look there and took the money so my brother came to me and he's like woody what's the scoop here you taking this money because he knew in his heart that he wasn't taking it and it is going missing every week so maybe it's me right it, it, it like it didn't hurt my feelings or anything but i had had the same thoughts about him pat are you taking this money? So we talked to each other about it. They kind of like brother to brother, like, you know, be honest with me. And we both walked away from the conversation knowing that the other guy was innocent, that, that we weren't stealing money from my mother's purse every week. But we didn't know what the scoop was, like how, like just baffled by the whole thing. Week four comes along and, and sort of nothing happens. Week five comes along and it's gone again. But this time, it, ha it was a little more brazen. Like people were up and about. It didn't just disappear overnight like it had before. And we found the purse in the backyard with its contents sort of scattered, right? So they, they took the purse, ran out the back door, grabbed the cash and just dropped everything else. Which in hindsight is kind of a courteous thief. Like if someone stole my wallet, the, the small amount of money I carry would be less of a big deal than all the like cards and driver's license and stuff that I'd have to get again. So when the purse was found in the backyard sort of scattered and we were all around when it happened, we called the police. And they came out there and they looked at it, and, but there wasn't a lot they could do. There wasn't like there was a really good trail they could follow. We didn't know exactly when it had happened. We just like knew that it did happen. So uh, the police had an idea who it might be, but that didn't really get them anywhere since all he had on him was cash. It's not really that incriminating. Let me get some more altitude. Wish me luck with this pull start. It starts pretty well when it's warm. Oh, you bitch. So, like five weeks in or so, my mother started doing something clever to thwart the thief. I forget what it was. Maybe she brought the purse upstairs or something like that, but that was done with. But, fun fact about me, through most of my teenage years, I slept downstairs on the couch. I don't know why, I don't know how I got away with it, but that just became my preference. I would like fall asleep to the TV on the couch most nights, almost every night. Anyway, 
the thief snuck in while I was sleeping and on my uh, on the coffee table next to our couch our living room had three couches he grabbed my wallet off the coffee table that I had taken out of my pants and it was this like surfer velcro type wallet that was popular at the time with surfers like me and he undid the velcro quietly I assume took the cash out and tossed the wallet on a different couch and when I woke up in the morning with my money gone it wasn't a lot it was like sixty dollars you know maybe a lot for teenage 1990 person but it was really the sense of invasion like as I processed how it went down you know how he must have pretty much reached over me how this guy was 18 inches from me while I was sleeping in my home took the money, tossed it on another couch and, and left. It was like mind blowing. Like, whoa, like th this, he was here, right here, stealing from me, but worse yet, invading my safe space. Like that's, <laughs> safe space kind of a loaded term now, but you just don't expect home invaders like that to steal from you over your sleeping body. And that's what happened. So my friends and I decided that we would take revenge on this guy. We had these stupid teenage plans that we were gonna like wait, lie and wait for him. And when he came, we'd tie him up and shave thief into his head. And we thought we were gonna keep him for a couple of days because we were stupid. Of course it didn't go down like that. We couldn't even stay quiet. So we were probably just making too much noise and he didn't come. And that was that. But uh, something did happen a week or two later. The thief, it turns out um, he was coming in through the basement. We hadn't figured out how he was breaking into the house until, until I saw him. And it's super late at night. Call it 3 a.m., 4 a.m., and I'm watching, I'll never forget, these on ESPN, they had these like lumberjack cutoff competitions and they'd have like motorcycle engines on chainsaws as they're just ripping through the wood. And I'm watching that quietly so as not to bother anyone. And I hear footsteps on the steps. And as I heard the footsteps, I, I kind of tried to convince myself that I didn't, that this wasn't happening. That was like my first reaction. And the basement had a door that, that led to the inside of the house, like to the first floor, I guess you'd call it. And I heard it creak. And when that happened, there was no denying that like it was go time. This guy was here entering my house and I was awake and I went to the door to confront the guy. But I need more altitude. So I go up to the basement door and I see his fingers wrapped around the door. He's a light skinned black guy and he's pulling the door closed from the inside. You know, I don't know why I didn't use the doorknob, but that, that's what I thought I saw. He was like carefully pulling the door closed. So I like shut the door on his fingers, opened it fast and started cursing at him. Right, every bad word I know at the top of my lungs, just you motherfucker, fucking dead, screaming at the guy, lots of bad words. He looks at me and he's stunned. Now, I was not, you know, the baddest guy on the block at, at 17 years old, but this guy was like the perfect criminal for me not to be frightened about. Uh, he was maybe five foot two, five foot four at the most, and skinny. His biceps were not much bigger than his wrists. So I'm yelling at him. We're locking eye contact and he's stunned. He literally falls down backwards down the stairs. And when he gets to the bottom of the stairs, he darts out to a door that leads outside the way that he came in. I chase him. But by the, like, we sort of go outside along the side of the house and he gets to the backyard. And at that point, like, I, I don't know what my thought process was exactly, but I stopped chasing him. Maybe I thought I didn't really want to catch him. I, I don't know. But uh, my father had heard the screaming and he darted out of bed, still in his pajamas raced down the stairs and out the backyard to chase the guy. Now, I think my father would have caught him. Uh, my father was a runner at the time. He was running like five, six days a week. I don't know, probably 25, 30 miles a week. And uh, 
but the the criminal had a bicycle store like a, a next door and uh he only had to make it that far and then he got onto a bike and he took off so we called the police and the police came uh and when we called them they went right to his house like they thought they knew who he was so they were going to catch him like on the way home but he didn't go there. Uh, they also went to the local convenience store. They thought maybe he'd buy something. Uh, it turns out the guy was a drug addict, which explains why he was stealing cash and it explains why he was so skinny. So he was stealing from us, I guess, in some, you know, addicted desperation. Not that it makes it okay, but, but that's his side. And uh, so the, the canine unit came and they followed his path for about a block they think but he kind of lost it i don't know how good a canine is like can they follow a guy on a bicycle zooming along like at top speed in fear maybe not so uh to wrap up like that part of the story uh i think they caught him uh, they didn't actually like contact me and say hey woody you know that guy that's been bugging you uh you know we put him in jail like that's not how that went down but I read in the local paper a little while later that a guy who fit, like, everything about his description had been convicted of, like, 39 counts of burglary. And uh, we think maybe that was enough, that they didn't need to add our, like, seven more onto it or whatever. So I think they got the guy and locked him up. But there were some, like, consequences of that and some lessons learned. So where does my pull start? I need more out. So that was the robbery part. There was a little more. Uh, the police came later and they asked me to identify him, right? But it wasn't like you see on TV where in person they have a lineup and you're picking the guy out. Maybe they all say a thing like, you know, I'll get you my pretty or something. No, instead they had a binder filled with pictures and I had to identify the guy's picture. So what I did is I would like point to a picture and look at the detective for confirmation. Like, is it this guy? Is it this guy? He did not play that game at all. He, he was he was not my assistant in identifying the guy. And in the end, I was like, it might be this guy. I'm, I'm not sure. And there was another thing. The guy was wearing a hat. Remember how he fell backwards down the stairs? And when the police got there and they were looking for him that night, I told him he was wearing a hat and I described it, it's like in the style of a 1920s paperboy hat. I don't know the name for that. And I said it was denim, right? So like a dark blue denim 1920s paperboy hat. And I had full confidence that that's what I saw. Well, the thing is when he fell down the stairs, his hat fell off. So it was still in the house. That's what the dog sniffed to try to find the guy. Uh, it, the hat was a baseball cap not a 1920s paperboy hat and it was blue but it was corduroy like ribbed and it said harlem globetrotters on the front now when i yelled at this guy i was close enough to him to put my arm on his shoulder like we were right there but i still got it wrong i couldn't id his picture and i didn't even know what his hat was like only that it existed and it's opened my eyes to how unreliable witness testimony can be. You know, when someone says, hey, I was right there. Dude, if you were hyped up, if, if it was something that was exciting to you, then eyewitness testimony can be garbage, right? I have heard that it's notoriously unreliable. It didn't really buy it, but having experienced it and been an unreliable witness that you'd think would be good because I was so close, I get it. Like, I get it now. So that was the robbery part. There was more though. Like I was kind of proud of my behavior that day, right? I thought like, I think it's brave. I think that's who I'd want to be, who I'd aspire to be on game day, confront the guy, yell at him, chase him out of the house, etc. So, so manly at 17. But after it ended, I was terrified, like the day after and the week after and the year after. Uh, I couldn't sleep without a weapon. Like I needed a knife under my bed. I needed a club under my bed, like something like that. I wasn't a gun owner. Um, or I just didn't feel at ease. Like I wasn't centered with my own sense of vulnerability in my house or my future houses. I had this recurring nightmare that, that I couldn't get away from. 
uh, what would happen is I'm, I'm sleeping in the bed and like a bad shadowy figure would open the door and I'd see a silhouette with light behind him. And with that, I would like try to wake up. But you know, there's like this state somewhere between sleep and, and awake where you're moved. I, like, I had a sleep paralysis. So I had sleep paralysis and I'm trying to like get up and confront the guy and like deal with the situation, but I can't move. So in reality, I can't speak. I'm just like, oh, 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 oh like just unable to get words out and I, and I can't move. So in the dream, which is like impacted by my reality, it manifests itself as paralyzed with fear unable to speak, unable to move as this guy approaches me and then later on, me and my wife in the dream. And that lasted for a decade. For 10 years, I had that nightmare. And it would go on and I would wake up just like drenched in sweat and kind of embarrassed that it happened to me. But you know, my wife was fantastic about it. It was actually like, it, it really made me appreciate her because she was so wonderful about dealing with something that I was kind of sensitive about. Let's get some altitude. I don't like to call what I went through PTSD. Right? Like, it sounds dumb, but somehow that feels like military cultural appropriation. Like, that, that belongs to them, that that's their domain. Also, like being robbed in your house in terms of traumatic events seems to pale in comparison to what some people in the military have to endure. Still, I don't know that it's really an inaccurate description. You know, 10 years of not feeling safe, 10 years of being like triggered by home invasion type things, creaks, bumps in the night, even now to some extent. And 10 years of, of waking up in a sweat, terrified of it happening again. Uh, you know, maybe PTSD is an accurate description of it. In any case, it's given me a better understanding of what military guys have gone through and what they have to endure. And like, I get it. Like, I feel like I was fairly brave on game day in the same way that a lot of people in the military are and then they have time to reflect on it and suddenly they're not feeling so good about everything that went down and to that I, I can kind of understand so uh, that's my my home invasion story uh, kind of freaked me out <laughs> for for a long time but I'm better now things are okay. I think we should start this motor, do some wingovers, and then bring her in for a landing, because strobe or not, I'm running low on time. Alright, we'll get a wrap or two. Check our altitude. We're good. When I said two wraps, I bet one on each hand. I'm not really doing these with two wraps, for those of you pilots that, that might be curious. I haven't flown this motor wing combo in a little while, so I'm kind of adjusting. Well now. Go big Woody, go big Woody! I think actually that's low enough. I could have turned more. The low acro is for silly heads. Sun's going down. I see better. No, just flying over the house. to fly it over that house too. I'm gonna put this right in. Maybe on this side. The 
like a butterfly with sore feet. <laughs> That's how you do it.